Yeah, all right. So um, welcome everybody to this webinar on acute appendicitis. We have uh, <clears throat> the pleasure to have two prominent speakers with us tonight, which are Professor Arnaud Bonnard from Paris, France, talking about operative management of acute appendicitis, and then Professor Thomas Wester from Stockholm, Sweden, uh, talking about conservative manage management. I also um, want to welcome my co-chair, Professor Augusto Zani from Toronto, and Gaia Tamaro, who is running the UPSA office and has so nicely set up this webinar for us again. And as you can see later, um, that's a pretty mobile office, sometimes out in the Italian sun. So um, for the audience, please take advantage also of the possibility to ask questions via the chat. And after the two talks, we will read them out loud and, and ask them to the speakers. Uh, introduce Professor Arnaud Bonnard. Um, he is uh, working in uh, Robert de Bray Children's Hospital in Paris. Did his surgical residency in Paris hospitals. And since uh, uh, 2001, he is uh, working at Robert de Bray first um, in his fellowship. Then um, from 2004 on as a staff surgeon and from 2010 on a professor of general surgery at this institution. Um, Arnaud also trained internationally in uh, 2006. He did a one-year NICU fellowship at the Sick Kids in Toronto with Jack Langer. And um, he also spent uh, seven months in Denver with uh, Steve Rothenberg uh, with a special training on thoracic surgery. His um, surgical interests include neonatal thoracic surgery and especially MIS and robotics. And um, on the research side, he is interested in basic science on NEC and Murine IBD models. Um, he has over 100 international publications and over 50 international Congress participations and lectures. And uh, yeah, finally, um, Professor Bonnard is a member of the UPSA Executive Board and a friend for many years. And Arno, it's an honor to have you with us tonight. And um, we are looking very much forward to your lecture and why you think that appendectomy is still the way to go. Arno, please. Thank you, Martin, for this kind of uh, presentations. And thank you uh, to Yupsa and Gaia to uh, organize and set up this uh, webinar on, on, on appendicitis. So I will talk about actually about uh, acute appendicitis and typically is presenting uh, on the 13 years old boy presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain since 36 hours, no more actually and pains and tenderness in the right lower quadrant and nausea and vomiting and asthenia sometimes and was a febrile about 38.1 celsius so what if i decide to operate on these patients or not to treat with antibiotics first of all the rate of failure and recurrence has been reported in literature about the medical treatment and in this paper uh, published by caruso in 2017 about 82 patients over uh, almost 200 patients were operated for failure of the medical treatment, which is 41% actually. It's almost one patient uh, on two. And they were operated during 24 to 48 hours after the beginning of the medical treatment. And uh, secondly, uh, the medical treatment, uh, the patients were uh, staying at the hospital for almost five days in average. If we look for this meta-analysis published by uh, uh, London's team, uh, it's, it's very uh, interesting because they, they, they review about 430 children receiving non-operative treatment uh, in this study and they were included in this meta-analysis. What they found is that the, the, the rate failure was between 13% to 19% uh, and even 27%. So it means that it works in some times, but uh, it doesn't work uh, about one third for uh, about uh, one third patients in this study published in 2004 by, by uh, Kaneko. Thirdly, uh, this is this paper published by uh, the Stockholm team, the Sweden teams, 
It's a five years follow up of randomized controlled trial uh, with uh, a range of follow up about uh, 5.3 uh, years. 11 failures in the non operative groups were operated. 11 uh, over 24 patients that were included in this, uh, in this uh, study. And two patients were operated after one year after the medical treatment. 12 visited the emergency department at least once. And one patient even visited the emergency, emergency department for three times. But 13 patients still had no undergone appendectomy and five patients with abdominal pain problems are presented during this, uh, this follow-up. It means that we talk about here about the medical treatment as a, de a definitive treatment of uh, acute appendicitis. So we're not talking about interval appendectomy you can do after this medical treatment. Let's talk about hospital cost and stay. This was published and reported in Journal of Pediatric Surgery in 2017. And the median total uh, length of stay was significantly longer in non-operative uh, treatment group, uh, about 34 hours, uh, comparing to the operative treatment where the patients were staying at the hospital for 15 days, uh, 15 hours, sorry. So nine, about in this paper, it was reported also a rate of failure of 35% in non-operative treatment. And the median, the median total hospital cost was sometimes some, something similar in both group, which means that the non-operative treatment was not costing uh, most, uh, a lot uh, compared to the surgical treatment. Going back on this meta-analysis published by the London team, 10 articles reporting 40, 430 children, as I said just before. On these four papers, they report a length of stay between non-operative treatment and appendectomy in favor of uh, the oh, in favor of the of the uh, of the of the uh, the appendectomy. In this paper uh, published in 2017, I would, yes. In this paper published in 2017, the report of, uh, that the treatment, the medical treatment was feasible in almost 50% of the patients. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, um, the appendectomy as a day case surgery was almost uh, done in 50% of patients. Uh, considering that our patient laparoscopic appendectomy for non-perforated appendicitis uh, in children, as they were reported that it was a safe practice and it was decreasing the length of stay and hospitals charge. And in Robert Debris Hospital, we're doing a, a, a day case surgery for uh, acute appendicitis and non-complicated appendicitis. And uh, basically where we, uh, we uh, see the patients at the emergency department, we start the patients on antibiotics and just uh, uh, call, uh, uh, and the patient is coming back the day after, uh, and we uh, schedule the patient for the day after as a decay surgery, and the patient is operated on the morning and it's discharged home on the afternoon. Talking about the low morbidity for surgery, in this paper published in 2019, so very recently, and about more than 9,000 uh, appendicitis and appendectomy, the rate of complications was reported to be uh, about 2%, which is quite low, and especially for uh, during the one year after the surgery. In this paper in 2019, also very recently published, 20 studies comparing non-operative treatment and surgical treatment. More than 3,600 patients were allocated to non-operative treatment and or uh, surgical treatment but it was a comprised adults and children. The higher complication-free treatment success rate was reported for the, the, for the appendectomy and was reported to be uh, 82% uh, compared to the 67% for uh, the, tr the non-operative treatment with antibiotics. And the treatment efficacy based on one-year follow-up rate was reported to be 93% compared to 70% uh, for the surgical treatment, which is proving that uh, the, the surgical treatment 
uh, uh, is uh, about low morbidity and 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 very uh, good efficacy compared to the the non-operative treatment. The all the all other things is about the trainee, and you know probably that the laparoscopic appendectomy is one of the first procedure that the trainee can perform by themselves, and it was reporting in. To, uh, in 2019, about 928 appendectomies, and they basically compared a team operated on acute appendicitis uh, comprising two residents, compared with one resident with an attending surgeon, and there were no difference in terms of postoperative morbidity, meaning that the training programs should encourage faculty to allow residents to manage this patient by themselves and to operate this patient by themselves because acute appendicitis is the perfect nice procedure to learn uh, to learn the surgical skills and to improve the surgical skills uh, during the laparoscopy. They, uh, they report also the learning curve and the learning curve is quite short because it's about 20 cases and uh, you know that you operate probably more than 100 uh, acute appendicitis a year. So it means that the learning curve is very, uh, very uh, is rich very quickly uh, uh, for a resident. So it's a pleasure to start laparoscopic program and to start a laparoscopic skill uh, in, in your department for the trainees and, and the resident. The other things is that we need to evaluate non-operative treatment uh, from the life impact and satisfaction questionnaire. And, and there is no, actually, there's no uh, study reported that uh, reported the uh, 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 questionnaire of satisfaction and quality of life for these patients uh, treated with a non operative management of appendicitis. Let's talk about neoplasm. So uh, appendiceal neoplasm has been reported and is well known uh, and has been reported in 2018. And in this paper in 2015, it were reported to be between 1.9 to 1.4% of appendiceal specimen. It means that 74% of appendiceal cancer have already spread and over one third have regional or distant metastasis at the diagnosis. It means that if you start a program, if you start, if you decided to not operate these patients for acute appendicitis and you decided to uh, treat with antibiotics without operate, so thinking about antibiotics as, as a definitive treatment of acute appendicitis, you maybe uh, leave some patients with uh, potentially uh, appendic uh, appendiceal uh, neoplasm. At least let's talk about inflammatory bowel disease. We know that the appendix is probably an important part of the immune system. And that the core function are originally lies in the attraction with gut flora. And the studies demonstrated its influence in innate and adaptive immune response in ulcerative colitis. It has been reported in 2018 that the inflammatory bowel disease on the other part has become a global disease meaning that it's the rate and the frequency of this, of this disease is accelerating incidence in newly in, in this, in this countries where societies have become more westernized. It means that the rate of IBD and the frequency of IBD is increasing in, in this country. And, uh, uh, and the appendix is a crucial role in the IBD and especially in the ulcerative colitis. In 2019, it has been reported that the appendectomy was effective in what third of therapy refractory ulcerative colitis patients, with a substantial proportion of patients demonstrating complete endoscopic remission after one year. It means that doing an appendectomy is probably protective for ulcerative colitis, even before the onset of the disease. This has been reported also in 2012, with a lower relapse rate in patients who have been uh, an appendectomy, who have uh, who had an appendectomy before the onset of ulcerative colitis, 21.5% compare, reduced requirement for immunosuppressions in patients who undergo for appendectomy, and a lower colectomy rates in patients who had already an appendectomy 
and developing uh, ulcerative colitis. So in conclusions, acute appendicitis remains a surgical disease for me because of no recurrence, uh, because the patients can be operated and managed as a day case surgery, meaning that it, uh, there, there is a low hospital cost, a low morbidity. It's a perfect procedure for trainees and residents. And uh, it's probably one of the, the first procedure they can do laparoscopically and it's voiding a neoplasm uh, misdiagnosed and just have a look at IBD and, and take this in, in part of your head. So maybe in a desert, if you are doing a trip in a desert, antibiotics are the good thing, but I don't think that the non-operative management as a definitive treatment of acute appendicitis should be employed. And uh, even, even the, the, in a desert, if you start the treatment with antibiotics, you can save the patients for sure. You can save you in self if you are, uh, if you've presented with appendicitis, but you will need probably a surgery to, to remove it after. Thank you. Thank you, Arnaud. This was uh, very well done. I think uh, you went through uh, all the various uh, aspects uh, of um, um, the potential uh, controversial aspects of uh, non-operative appendicitis, uh, so the complications, uh, the costs, uh, the importance for training, uh, uh, quality of life of patients, uh, potential, potential complications if uh, carcinoid, the neoplasm is, uh, is present. So we are very, very eager to hear what uh, Professor Thomas Wester has uh, to tell us to actually um, try to convince us about uh, non-perforated appendicitis. Uh, Thomas Wester has, does not need uh, any introduction. Uh, he is the head of the pediatric surgery uh, unit at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm. He's the president of our association, UPSA, and is the deputy coordinator of the European Reference Network, uh, Ernica. Uh, Thomas uh, uh, graduated from a medical school uh, at uh, Umea University in Sweden. Uh, he trained in pediatric surgery at the University Children's Hospital in Uppsala. Uh, well, did research with Professor Puri uh, uh, in the in the um, in Dublin and uh, defended his doc doctoral thesis on aspects of human enteric nervous system, a study of the normal development uh, and of Ischbrunk's disease. And in fact, Ischbrunk's is one of his uh, research interests uh, uh, together with uh, anorectal malformations, intestinal failure, neck, and of course, uh, appendicitis. And Thomas uh, has, uh, has been uh, um, really one of the first proponents uh, of uh, non-operated appendicitis in, uh, sorry, of non-operative uh, treatment of acute non-operated appendicitis in children. Um, with seminal papers that uh, have been published on uh, annals uh, of surgery. And so, as I said, I'm really eager to hear uh, your um, opinion uh, about uh, uh, these controversial aspects, Thomas. Perfect. So, th first of all, thank you very much to Augusto and uh, Martin for organizing these webinars, and also to Gaia, who is sort of instrumental to, to have this, this done. Uh, I'll talk briefly about non-operative treatment of acute uncomplicated appendicitis. Like uh, Arno Bernard said, I will not, not talk about uh, perforated appendicitis with diffuse peritonitis or appendiceal masses or abscesses. Uh, as uh, Arno said, Emergency appendectomy is the uh, first line treatment of acute appendicitis in children and has been so for, for more than a century. But uh, the question today is whether children can, with acute non perforated appendicitis, can be treated without appendectomy. And I first would like to show you this, this figure. Maybe you have seen it before, it's uh, more than a decade old, and it describes the understanding of the pathophysiology in acute appendicitis. And in the, in the upper part of the figure, you see the traditional understanding of appendicitis, where uh, perforated 
the proportion of perforated appendicitis is increasing over time from day to day. The, the proportion of perforated appendicitis is higher and higher due to a progress of the disease. Uh, in the lower part of the figure, which is the modern or, or alternative understanding of the pathophysiology, the, uh, the, the proportion of perforated appendicitis is similar at the end of, of the time period or at, at four days in this case, but not due to the progress of disease with perforation, but rather due to the resolution of symptoms in, in patients who have non-perforated or uncomplicated appendicitis. And I, I think this, this image is very important for, for, as I said, for the understanding of passive physiology in acute appendicitis and has con contributed or, or been very important to the to the description of acute appendicitis as actually two different disorders or two different diseases, uncomplicated appendicitis and complicated appendicitis with different clinical presentation, uncomplicated appendicitis often with relatively mild symptoms and complicated appendicitis progressing from, from relatively mild disease but quickly perforating. And in this group, you all also see the patients that are now described with, with septicemia. Uh, it's not the clinic, just the clinical presentation which differs, but there, there are more and more data showing that there are different epidemiology, different microbiology, and different inflammatory response in these two groups. And I, I think this is, is very important for the rational behind discussing uh, treatment of, of appendicitis with antibiotics. And uh, I think when, when we first got interested in this and started to look, wanted to start looking at this in children, we did uh, this systematic review in adults. Uh, as you know, there were studies done in adults before studies were done in children. And uh, in this systematic re review, which included four randomized controlled trials, actually three of them done in Sweden. The first published already in 1995. Uh, it was possible to show that looking at failure of antibiotic treatment versus negative appendectomy in the appendectomy group, there were no difference between the groups. It was also possible looking at complication to show that there was the, the forest plot was in favor of treatment with antibiotics. Uh, and uh, also when it came to the proportion of patients who did not need an appendectomy during the first year of follow-up, you saw that more than 70% more than of patients still had their, append had their appendix in place at one year follow-up. So after having done this, which was actually a study in favor of treatment with antibiotics, we designed a trial, a randomized control trial, which is a pilot trial without a power analysis, which was published in Annals of, of Surgery in 2015. Jan Svensson is the first author. I saw he was in the, in the audience here. And the aims of this, this study was to evaluate the feasibility of recruiting children with acute appendicitis to an RCT comparing non-operative treatment with appendectomy but also to actually evaluate safety of treatment with antibiotics in uncomplicated appendicitis in children and to generate pilot data to inform a future planned efficacy study. We, we randomized 50 patients. Uh, as I said, we didn't do a power calculation as this was a pilot trial. And we included children from five to 15 years of age uh, with a clinical diagnosis of appendicitis who prior to the trial would have been subject to appendectomy. And we excluded all patients with perforated appendicitis on the basis of general peritonitis, but also patients with an appendiceal mass. Uh, we randomized the patients to acute appendectomy or antibiotics in total for 10 days, the first two days with intravenous antibiotics. And the endpoints were the primary outcome was the resolution of symptoms without significant complications 
And the secondary endpoint that we looked at was recurrence of appendicitis within one year, but we also looked at other, other things. We enrolled uh, or randomized 51 patients, one of these patients withdraw consent. So we finally analyzed 24 patients in the antibiotics group and 26 patients in the appendectomy group. And uh, the results in the appendectomy group were very good. There were no complications, no ap negative appendectomy. So all 26 patients had resolution of symptoms without significant complications. In the antibiotics group, uh, 22 of the 24 patients had a resolution of symptoms without complications, where two patients required an early appendectomy after uh, two and nine days, respectively. And then on top of this, during the first year of follow-up, there were another seven, seven patients who underwent went appendectomy. Only one of those patients had an appendicitis when we did histology. So in, in conclusion, we uh, found that it was feasible to actually enroll patients for a study like this, and that it was also safe to treat append ant appendicitis with, with antibiotics in children. And uh, the efficacy was 92%, whereas 62% uh, had, there, had not undergone appendectomy during the first year of follow-up. Uh, there are several other trials. Actually, this is the only one randomized control trial so far, but uh, the, there are few systematic reviews. These are not the only ones. Uh, the papers included in the sy different systematic reviews are slightly different, and also the, the, um, the parameters or, or outcome measures used in the systematic reviews are slightly different. There is one review from Kessler and co-workers showing that the, the treatment efficacy favored appendectomy. Uh, there was no difference when it comes to complications, but also readmission rate favored appendectomy. In the uh, study or the systematic review that Arnaud mentioned, the treatment success was actually 97%. There was no difference when it comes to complications between the groups and recurrent of appendicitis was 14%. Uh, and the long-term efficacy, no appendectomy was done in, at last follow-up in 82% of the, of the patients. So 18% of the patients had undergone an appendectomy. So as you see, there, there is a variation in the findings between different trials. We actually published a systematic review from Stockholm last year where we looked at the treatment efficacy. We included in for this parameter 16 studies uh, where we found a treatment efficacy which was defined as discharge without further complications of 92 percent. Uh, we also looked at complications uh, including negative appendectomy in the appendectomy group where there was no difference between the two groups. In this, in this, uh, for this parameter we looked at eight studies and we also looked at length of hospital stay in seven studies and there was no difference between the two groups. When it comes to recurrent appendicitis, 16% uh, had undergone uh, an appendectomy uh, at last follow-up and for this parameter 21 studies were included. Uh, so what happens long term is, is a bit unclear. Uh, Arnaud already mentioned this study which was recently published where we followed up the pilot randomized control trial that we did with a, a medium follow-up now of 5.3 years after randomization and still there were no complications in the group treated with antibiotic with appendectomy uh, whereas uh, 11 of the 24 patients treated non-operatively had undergone appendectomy at the five-year follow-up nine of these as i mentioned before had had their appendectomy during the first year after randomization whether another two of the, these 11 had their appendectomy more than one year after the uh, randomization. Actually, both of these patients undergoing appendectomy later on had uh, appendicitis on histology. 
So just showing this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, you see that a bit more than 50% of the patients have their appendix, appendix in place uh, at five years follow-up, but not all of them, all them had uh, histologically confirmed appendicitis. This is quite similar. This one is upside down, but it's a, a figure from, from an adult study where uh, approximately 40% of the patients have undergone appendectomy at five years. These are two of the very few long-term follow-up studies so far, but the figures, as you see, are quite similar in children and in this trial in adults. So uh, coming back to the question I started with, I think that children with acute non-perforated appendicitis can be treated without appendectomy. Uh, the treatment efficacy, which uh, could be defined as the charge without complications, is approximately 90%. The complication rate seems to be similar to that after appendectomy. Uh, and recurrent appendicitis or appendectomy at five-year follow-up seems to be at least less than 50%. Uh, there, as many of you know, there are several trials going on in this field, and I think it's very important to continue having good, uh, well-powered studies in this area. And uh, looking a couple of days ago at clinical tri clinicaltrials.gov, there were nine trials searching for non-operative treatment of appendicitis in, in children. Uh, a few of them seem to have been terminated but there are still a few studies among those, at least four randomized control studies going on. There are also a couple of parent or patient choice prospective case control studies going on. And I think it's very important to wait for the outcomes of these trials. Uh, there are a few aspects on non-operative treatment, which I think is, are important to just briefly mention or discuss. And one is, which I think is a very relevant point, what happens with uh, antibiotic resistance or resistance to antibiotics when you treat patients with, with antibiotics who could be operated on. And I think we know, don't know a lot about that, not at an individual level or at a community level. I also think that there are issues related to microbiota or microbiome when you treat patients with, with antibiotics. And, and actually, I found this with this protocol for a trial uh, designed from a group in Finland who have been doing a lot of research in this area. And I think that's a, a very different, difficult, or very important field to get more knowledge about in relation to non operative treatment of, of uh, appendicitis. Uh, another thing which I think is also very, very interesting and very important is the idea to treat not with antibiotics, but with, with nothing at all, just uh, nil per mouth and fluids and wait and see. And uh, again, there is a, a protocol published a couple of years ago or last year, I think it was, uh, which is a, a study in or a trial in adults designed to, to co compare antibiotics with placebo. And I think this is in line with, which, with, with what has been done in, for instance, colonic diverticulitis. And it's probably also in line with the understanding of the pathophysiology, which I first described, where there's probably a high uh, proportion of, of patients with appendicitis who undergo spontaneous resolution of their symptoms. Uh, there are a few other issues which I think are important in, for this discussion. And uh, Arnaud mentioned the risk for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, where it was shown quite, quite a few years ago that appendectomy leads to a decreased risk for ulcerative colitis. Uh, actually, very recently, there are publications uh, indicating that there is a risk for depressive and anxiety disorders after appendectomy. There are also indications that there is a risk for diverticular disorders and also myocardial infarction after a panectomy. But I don't know, I, I think we don't know enough about all these uh, potential associated effects of undergoing an appendectomy. 
I just want to very, very briefly mention the impact of COVID-19, where I think in many centers, uh, non-operative management has been used due to uh, limited hospital resources. Uh, and I, I think there will be a lot of publications in this field in, in the near future. On the other hand, I think there are several, several centers who continue to do appendectomy also with good results during the pandemic. But, but in this area, there will be, I think, a lot of publications in, in recent times. So to, to conclude, uh, maybe I'm not as convincing as Arnaud in my arguments. I actually, this is a, a quote from a, a meta-analysis done on a study based on, on adult studies. Where, where it's actually said that although antibiotics may prevent some patients from appendectomy, surgery represents a definitive one-time only treatment with well-known risk profile, whereas the long-term impact of antibiotic treatment of patient quality of life and health care costs is unknown. And uh, I personally, I think that appendectomy is still the standard of care for uncomplicated acute appendicitis in children. And I think it's very important to continue these large trials uh, comparing antibiotics with appendectomy. But I, I think that antibiotic therapies should actually be reserved for patients included in these controlled trials. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, this was very comprehensive and uh, very much evidence-based. Uh, so, um, Definitely, there is, uh, as we've seen, uh, there's a lot of trials and uh, a lot of interest. And um, one of the points that you touched on at the very end was, in fact, about uh, the use of antibiotics and the possi possibility of uh, uh, resistance. And so, in fact, we have a question uh, uh, to you um, about from uh, Balash. Fadgias, I hope I pronounced it well. If you use meropenem and metronidazole uh, for uh, the uncomplicated acute appendicitis patients, uh, uh, what do you uh, think about antibiotic resistance? Is it safe? And uh, what will we do if uh, meropenem is not enough? Well, I, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first, first of all, I, I would say this, this is a very relevant question, a very relevant uh, problem. And uh, I think we, we don't have knowledge enough to, to say, say a lot about it. I, but I, I think looking at the trials that have been done, the trials are usually not designed to, uh, to look at which antibiotics is the best, but rather designed to, to look whether antibiotics works. So for instance, I think you, the meropenem and metronidazole that we used for the pilot trial, that was, I think the reason for that was to have quite a broad spectrum antibiotic to avoid complications related to infections. So that was a way to, to manage uh, the situation in, in sort of the first pilot trial where we didn't want, want these, these complications. But I, I think the, for instance, the, the large trial we are running now, which is called the API trial, it's designed in a very pragmatic base. So each center in that multi-center trial, they are using the antibiotics they are used to, to have. So it's not, not uh, stipulated in the, in the protocol which antibiotics you should use. And I, I think at the end of the day, we don't know enough about antibiotic resistance, and I, but I think it's a very relevant point. There is another question uh, from Sergei Klusev. Um, would you, to Thomas again, would you consider time for the beginning of symptoms as a criterion for non-operative management or only clinical presentation? If yes, when will you not try non-operative management? Well, I, I don't think there is a, a definitive cutoff uh, for for non-operative treatment. I, I think it's more based on, on the clinical findings and present, clinical presentation of the patient. Uh, Thomas touched on the pandemic and uh, I have to say here in my hospital tickets in uh, Toronto, we had a conversation uh, uh, on how to 
manage patients uh, with acute appendicitis, we do see many. We, we, we treat about four to 500 patients a year. And uh, the majority of, uh, of the surgeons uh, decided to go for acute appendicitis. So of course we work uh, collegially all together and we decided uh, that uh, this is what we uh, are doing. Uh, although some of us uh, were uh, more in favor of trying uh, uh, using the uh, having a, the other approach, the conservative approach with antibiotics. Can I ask you or no? Uh, because you talked, uh, of course, about a laparoscopic uh, appendectomy. Did you uh, change anything uh, during now the pandemic? And uh, unfortunately, all countries have been hit very hard. The par Paris at some point was. Uh, a hotspot um, in terms of uh, equipment, not just for the operator, but also for uh, the laparoscopy. We didn't change anything actually. Uh, uh, for appendicitis, acute appendicitis, or uh, even for other surgical procedure. Uh, we're still doing laparoscopy. We didn't change any, uh, any indication in this. And um, from the material point of view, uh, we didn't change the material. We uh, think about analyze the, the smoke uh, uh, to look for uh, uh, RNA uh, uh, of the virus in the smoke, uh, but we didn't, we didn't so far. Uh, and uh, it's quite sometimes difficult to do actually, uh, but uh, we didn't change anything and we still operate the patients with the uh, laparoscopic approach. Also, also positive uh, patients, but patients with also uh, positive patients. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I comment. Please. Yeah. We, we we actually switched to conservative treatment and and didn't actually randomize patients to the trial where we are part for for a couple of months during the the peak of the pandemic. Uh, I think we we started again by the end of June or something like that to to uh, randomize patients to the trial or to offer appendectomy as the first line treatment for patients who didn't want to be part of the trial. But I, I think one, one concern, it was not just for the anesthetists or the surgeons and the, the work environment issue. I think that initially there was also concerns about how patients with COVID should react to anesthesia and surgery. And I, I think there are these publications, quite recent publications showing that Elderly people they have a they have a high risk for both mortality and, and severe lung complications if they are operated when they have a COVID when they are COVID nineteen positive. But I think by now or in those studies there are no indications that that children or individuals at least less than thirty or something like that has an increased mortality or, or risk for lung complications. So I think it's there is no real benefit for the patient to to not be operated. It's more an environmental thing, I think. I've heard uh, of centers that actually moved uh, away from laparoscopy, but decided still to operate. And so start, this is in the Middle East and they uh, started doing, op re restarted doing open appendectomies, which is a very interesting uh, point too. So. Mm. Actually, the, the rate of positive patients is quite low and it's, it's about minus five, even less than 5% in our center. And for the patients we operate and uh, who were positive for the COVID, uh, there were no over mobility on, the, on these patients and especially uh, from the lung wise and uh, the respiratory wise. And uh, they were operated, uh, I think for periodon uh, yeah, diffuse periodonitis. And uh, basically it's, it's the only things what, why we decided to operate, even if you were, you were, if you were positive and there was no over mobility after. So, so I know um, I, I, uh, I heard from your talk that you do a lot of same day surgery for acute appendicitis. How is this accepted by the patients? You know, there is a, a lot of data from the United States. They're doing that for appendicitis and cholecystectomies and so on. Are the French children like stronger? Because in Germany, this is like uh, unheard of. The, the children, they would not go home the same day. Are we just too weak or 
what what is what is going on <laughs> so actually we um, yeah i mean it's the family in france are accepting very well this uh, this way of management uh, because uh, basically you discharge the 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 the, the child the, the day where you seeing uh, him uh, at the emergency department and we started on, on antibiotics and then he's going back the day after and he has already uh, 12 hours or 24 hours of antibiotics and uh, he's operated the same day and uh, yeah I mean it's we use the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, pain control and just uh, and 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 yeah I mean I don't know it's 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 something you have to think about. I mean, if if you're starting to say to the parents, you know, it's gonna be very difficult for him to be discharged the same day, la la la, blah blah blah. It's different that if you saying to the parents, we operate this day and is going is going back home this afternoon, and the parents say, oh, okay, and that's right, and we don't have any uh, uh, patients who's coming back uh, in. During the the thirty uh, the thirty days or a day for admission was quite low, about zero to uh, to two percent. So it, uh -huh. yeah, it works very well. I don't know. May I ask you one thing? Yeah. When you when you give the patients antibiotics and you wait for twelve hours, do you see patients who recover and who you cancel from from the list who don't need an operation? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, there's an, some patients are presented with an improvement of the, of the symptoms. And uh, when they're going back the day after, they almost have no pain and, and they're no free ride anymore. Uh, but we still, <laughs> we still operate on it. <laughs> That's uh, very interesting. Uh, I, there's a question from Amra Elias. Uh, about the involvement of the families, which is along these lines. Uh, uh, and I think this would be more uh, for uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, um, uh, any comments or thoughts about family involvement in the decision making regarding medical surgical treatment? Or is it too early to involve uh, families in such a controversial issue? Well, th thank you for, for that question. Uh, as I, I said, in, in our institution, we we participate in this trial called the API trial. So we offer uh, patients or families where the child has an uncomplicated appendicitis to participate in that trial, where they are obviously randomized to one treatment or the other. Uh, and if they don't want to participate, we, we uh, do as a standard treatment uh, appendectomy. So we don't, we don't offer antibiotic treatment with antibiotics outside the trial at the moment. Uh, I, I think uh, perhaps you refer to the trials done in, in the United States, which are trials based on parent choice or patient choice, where which are, I think, very good trials. But I think in, in, in our group or in the group running the API trial, we are quite convinced that the it, it would be uh, preferable to actually have data from a randomized controlled trial that there are met methodological issues with the parent choice design. Hmm. I've, got an, I've got another question about this uh, carcin uh, carcinoid and uh, malignancy discussion. Uh, Arno had, had a few slides on that and I, I mean the the prevalence is is maybe below one percent overall, and to me it is um, okay to treat conservatively and not be too concerned because I think if we if this would have been a problem, we would see much more children with metastasized carcinoid disease. So, I know, and and then Thomas, what is your what is your take on this? Is this really a concern? to you in daily practice to leave an appendix in and then the patient may develop a carcinoid or has a carcinoid and this is just not detected? Or is that a theoretical? Yeah, it's quite difficult to say and to respond uh, accurately to these questions. I mean, in 15 years here, we have two cases of carcinoid uh, on patients. And uh, most of the time it was a, a, a uh, incidental uh, uh, discover on the pathology 
and there were no symptoms of nothing and the patient was not reoperated after to complete the resections or doing a colectomy or right colectomy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, only two cases in 15 years. You, you're right, it's probably less than 1%. It's quite rare. And, uh, it, but I don't know if, if it's a real, uh, it's a real problem if you decided to treat medically with uh, antibiotics only. And, 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 and I don't know exactly the risk uh, to live in place of patients with uh, carcinoid. Um, I would say it's quite where and very where and I don't think that we will discover later a patient developing some metastasis disease after a carcinoid. I don't know. Thomas, what do you say? Well, uh, as you say, I, I think the incidence is, is relatively low. I think it's probably less than 1%. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure what happens if, if a patient gets appendicitis with a carcinoid, whether that responds to treatment with antibiotics I think we don't know really, but you could sort of speculate that the carcinoid maybe obstructs the appendix to a degree where it does that that, that the inflammation doesn't respond to to antibiotics. But I, I don't, I'm not sure actually. I think that when it comes to appendiceal mass and and interval appendectomy, I think there is it becomes more and more common that that centers actually have an institutional protocol where, where interval appendectomy is not done. We haven't done interval appendectomy in symptom-free patients for many years. Was this after the, this China study from Nigel Hall in three years ago? Nigel study indicates, as most of you know, that there, there is no, no real indication for, for an interval appendectomy. Is that the protocol in, in Paris also? No interval appendectomy, Arno? For uh, abscesses and uh, or mass appendicillus? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing appendectomy, interval appendectomy, two months after the medical treatment for all these cases. Okay. I have to say, I, based on that trial, and I was also involved in that trial, I always uh, um, offer the family um, the, the two options, uh, and invariably, I would say 99% of my patients uh, uh, want to go for an appendectomy. And it's not because I am uh, talking into a surgery, but it's also, I think, uh, very much depends on uh, where you are in the world. So the Canadians like going, for instance, to the States uh, uh, or the Caribbeans uh, for holidays, escaping the, 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 uh, the snowy weather here. And uh, they don't want to be presented with a very expensive bill if uh, their kid uh, eventually has a belly ache and they need to attend a hospital uh, in Florida, let's say. And for this reason, uh, I, as I said, 99% of the families uh, want to have the appendix out. So it's an it's a interesting uh, uh, perspective. There's a question from Theodorus Dionysus. Uh, any complications of positive COVID-19 appendicitis patients in the operative group that you know of or no? Yes, or, uh, or as, as, as we said, first of all, the rate of patients uh, positive for COVID-19 uh, who have been operated in appendicitis are very low, uh, probably less than 5%. And the patients we operated on it, uh, there were no complications related to the COVID-19 and, and, and no overrate of morbidity uh, regarding the appendectomy or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, Thomas, uh, if a patient with non-operative management fails, what is the most common reason? Maybe you can, maybe I didn't really whether we, you showed data on the why do they fail yes. well, why does non operative management fail in in which patient and i mean that's that's one of the one of the purposes of, of waiting for these large trials uh, i think a few of the patients who fail they actually have a misdiagnosed perforated appendicitis as you know there has been a lot of discussions about fecalites and whether a fecalit has an, an or increased the risk of, of recurrence or, or of, of uh, 
making it more difficult to, to treat the, the appendicitis in patients with uh, yeah, treated, treated conservatively. But there are, at least when it comes to, to fecalis and recurrences, the data are, are conflicting, but there are data indicating that the fecalit in increases the risk. There are also data that are not as convincing. But I, I think maybe in our, our series, the most common reason is that it, it, we have, the patient has a missed perforated appendicitis. Okay, thanks. Um, Professor Raman Mitul is asking, uh, do any of you perform surgeries for acute appendicitis in the middle of the night or early morning hours? We, we actually do, but that, I think uh, we try not to, but we, we do because uh, it's, the theaters are so busy, so we have difficulties doing it during daytime. So therefore, we, we quite frequently do it during night. We wouldn't like to do that. But. Uh, we have, in Paris, we have the chance, in my hospital, we have the chance to have a, a room in OR dedicated to the emergency. So it means that the patient is not operated during the night and, and is shift for the morning or, or later in the day. Yeah. I think there's also good data that they don't perf while in the hospital. So you can just wait. Yes, for us, it's uh, been uh, challenging uh, with uh, waiting for the COVID tests and so for the results. And that's, of course, as you know, it, it very much depends nowadays uh, when uh, uh, the test has been uh, run and when we get the results. I think we are, it's uh, 11.05. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of um, interest and I think it was a great webinar. Uh, of course, it's also it's interesting to see that appendicitis still attracts a lot of uh, uh, attention, and especially now with the pandemic, is one of the conditions that uh, we're looking at uh, um, even more. It's interesting. Uh, I, I can see that uh, Ramon Gorter from uh, the Netherlands has also joined us. Uh, Ramon is uh, running uh, a study under the auspices of UPSA. Um, where we are registering patients uh, from all over the world uh, and just to understand how we, things have changed uh, between uh, before and after the pandemic. So this is uh, specifically for, uh, for uh, the management of appendicitis. So um, it will be very interesting to, to hear the results uh, uh, shortly. So, um, Martin. Yes. When's the next uh, webinar? We have uh, an. Uh, yeah, I think August. Um, I think Gaia can maybe just um, share uh, her screen, and then we go um, through the through that. But before we do that, I really want to also thank the two speakers and the the as always great discussion on that um, on that topic. I think we 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 sort of uh, post all the questions that uh, we saw in the chat. And I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, it's not really sure where the future will lead us. And um, it was also very interesting to see how many studies there are uh, ongoing with uh, results really like um, coming very soon.